the importance of preparedness of our hearts as we come together and recognize who we're amongst, particularly we're amongst the Lord. He's the most important guest that we have here, and I, I guess guest isn't the right word because this is his house, and we're more guests here than he is. So, um, But uh, thank the Lord that we can be here in his presence this evening. We can share the time together, and uh, it's been a, a wonderful time of worship already, and I look forward to the remainder of it tonight. Well, we're in 1 Peter chapter 2 this evening, and in our last study together in 1 Peter, I preached from chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, that was two weeks ago, and one of the emphasis of that text was the significance of God's Word. It doesn't take very much uh, looking back and review to be able to see that that is the, the central thing in focus, and in particular, it emphasized that God's Word is enduring and that it is extremely valuable, priceless beyond compare. And in light of those realities, chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3 that we'll consider this evening command us to hunger for this valuable word, to hunger above all other things. Now, frankly, um, there may not be a less debatable idea amongst conservative Christians like us than the value of Scripture and the importance of studying it. But while we all may agree in word that studying the Bible is important, I wonder what kind of results we'd get if we took a very simple yes or no survey of the question, are you content with your study of Scripture? My guess is that an overwhelming majority would answer no, even though we all recognize the importance of Bible reading and of Bible study and of Bible application. There's a number of reasons for this type of discontentment that many believers have about their, uh, their intake of Scripture. For some, it's a matter of discipline, or lack of discipline, rather. They don't manage their lives well enough to spend time in Scripture. For some, it's a matter of life circumstances. They're extremely busy with many different things, maybe with young children or school or work or a combination of those or many other things, and they allow it to upend their priorities or what should be their priorities. They're running so hard that it's difficult to find a quiet time when their mind is sharp enough to really engage with the Lord in the scriptures. Other people study God's word regularly, but they don't seem to be getting as much out of their study as they would like. Um, many other challenges that we could mention, but how can we overcome these challenges? Unfortunately, uh, I don't have a magic pill that will immediately and easily solve this problem for any one of us. Life is busy. That's a reality. We can't, uh, we can't disregard that. Our minds and our bodies get tired and distracted, don't they? And the sin nature particularly actively resists a proper hunger and a proper response to Scripture. There's no simple way to remove those challenges, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't work earnestly to stay sharp, and to improve our intake of God's word. Now, Peter recognized this need, and he challenged his readers to press forward in that all-important all work. And in so doing, he gave us a tremendous challenge and some very helpful instruction that I doubt that we consider as much as we should. And we're going to consider it a bit this evening. So if you'll turn your, your eyes and your hearts to 1 Peter chapter 2, and would you stand together with me here? We're going to read these three verses as we prepare to break, the, break down and analyze a bit of this scripture tonight. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Let's pray. Father, we bow our hearts and yield in humble submission to the scriptures and to what you have to say to us this evening. And we pray that you, as you alone can do, would open our eyes, that we would behold wondrous things out of your word tonight. Oh Lord, continue, I pray, to do your work of preparation and tilling our hearts so that we're able to receive, and I pray that we would receive the full benefit of your truth this evening, and then apply it, be transformed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Before we begin, it's helpful to note that Peter clearly indicated his central concern through the grammar of the text, and I want to point your minds to that first of all. Verse 2 commands, desire the sincere milk 
of the word. That's the command, and the remainder of the text supports that command. It's also important to note that the word wherefore, that begins verse 1, ties this text directly back to chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. And those verses, as I mentioned, they teach that God's word is what brought us spiritual life and has enduring value beyond this life for all of eternity. If you're a child of God amongst us this evening, the Bible has already proven its worth in that it has led you to salvation through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we must seek to know it more and more and more. And so, how do we go about fulfilling this command? Desire the sincere milk of the word. Before Peter gave the command to desire the word, I want you to see that he gave a crucial condition that is necessary in order to have a proper desire of God's word. Don't miss it. Number one, the condition for receiving God's word is that we must purify our relationships, right? This also ties back uh, directly to the previous few verses, which, got, which commanded God's children, remember, to love the brethren properly. That was the focus of the last portion of scripture we looked at. That was, the, uh, that was largely the focus of the last study. Now, chapter 2 and verse 1 says to lay aside five evil practices. It's important to note that this verse is set up grammatically as a condition that must be fulfilled before we can properly receive the word of God. And it reflects this dependence with the wording laying aside. Do you see it in verse 1? Um, it's the second and third words there in the text. So wherefore, based on everything he'd said already, laying aside. We must lay aside these things that he's going to mention in order to properly desire the word. And by the way, Better make sure that we lay aside these things in light of what we're going to observe together immediately following the preaching as well. And that should be a central thought that we have all the time. But it's crucial for us to reiterate this in light of what he says here. While verse 1 supports the central command of verse 2, it still bears the full force of a command itself, right? So remember I said that the central command of the entire text is to desire the sincere milk of the word. But verse 1 also has a command in it. It is supportive, but, but it is a command as well. Verse 1 isn't merely a strategy for improving your reception of the word of God or some recipe for success. God commands us to put off these practices, to lay them aside. The verb phrase laying aside comes from a single Greek word. It's apotithemi, and it gives the basic picture of taking off garments, Therefore, Peter's commanding us to strip our lives of the sinful practices that are, that are listed here, to take them off, to shed them, to put them aside. Don't put them back on again. There's, a, there's an indication of some, uh, some radical transformation that is taking place, some sanctification that's taking place. There is a deliberate change of life that doesn't just sway right back to the same thing again. These things have been taken off and laid aside. We're to take them off. We're to make a complete break from them. And so very briefly, let's consider the sins that Peter listed here. And remember that we're answering the question, how can we desire the sincere milk of the word as we ought to? How can we grow in that urge to absorb and to apply the word of God? This condition has to be met before that's ever going to happen. The first thing that he mentioned is malice. Malice. It's a general term that encompasses all forms of evil desires and action. But, um, but in this text, it's especially concerned with evils against other people. It's not just generally evil or immorality, but it is evil that's done against another brother. And that's plain because the other four sins listed are all relational sins that we may have towards other people. Peter commanded us to put off all malice or every single evil intention and action towards other people. Peter was specifically thinking in the context of a local church. 
Don't miss that. That's been the reality all through this letter so far. It'll continue to be all the way to the end. And we know that because this text continues the thought of that previous paragraph. And chapter 1 and verse 22 specifically mentioned love for the brethren, love for one another. That is in the context of a local church. Both references to that. And therefore, Peter's primary concern was that we remove malice and these other vices from the life of a church of Jesus Christ, though it's safe to assume that the principle applies applies broadly to all relationships that these things should be removed from, but particularly to a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it, but we've spent some time talking about Peter and his character and the way that he just was, his, his general makeup and some of his tendencies, especially early on in his life when we have the examples from the Gospels. He was a man that needed to lay aside a lot of malice, a lot of ill intent towards brothers and wrong thinking towards them. And so he's speaking from personal experience and recognizing from what he had learned and gained and grown in the necessity to do this. So he says, in order to desire the sincere sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, first of all, you have to lay aside all malice. That's all that I'm going to say about malice. We're just going to hurry on through these. I just want you to get the big picture. But he secondly said that we must lay aside all guile, hypocrisies, and envies. And I'm intentionally going to group those together. Peter repeated the word all at the front of this list of three things to drive home the fact that these sins have absolutely no place in a church. No place. It is not lay aside some guile and some of the hypocrisies and some of the envies, but all of it. Don't give place to any of it. Guile refers to any form of dishonesty intended to gain an advantage over another. Brethren, honesty and integrity must characterize our relationships. Next, God commanded us to put off hypocrisies. A hypocrite is somebody who lives an inconsistent life in order to hide an evil heart or a sinful lifestyle. It's the father who's always angry at home, but as soon as he gets out of the car at church, he miraculously transforms into a kind, caring leader. It's the person who lays uh, or who says uh, uh, all sorts of terrible things about a fellow church member to his friends but then treats him like a close friend whenever he's in the room. Hypocrisy is closely related to guile because hypocrisy is living a lie to save face or to gain some selfish advantage over another. It is wicked through and through, and we must live consistent lives that demonstrate genuine, unfeigned, unpretended godliness. We cannot be content to put on a show of godliness that's ultimately a lie. Remember, in the previous verses, the emphasis was on unfeigned love of the brethren. Unfeigned. That means that it is sincere. It's unpretended. It's not just an outward show. The next sin that he says must be laid aside is envies. Envy is the selfish jealousy and unhappiness that people feel over the good that others experience because it didn't happen to them. It's an insidious thing. I'm sure that you've experienced it just like I have. For example, a friend gets a promotion and a pay raise. And rather than rejoicing over their blessing, you're quietly unhappy and discontent that they can enjoy things that you don't have. That's not just for non-Christians or unbelievers. Christians do those kinds of things all the time, unfortunately. Or maybe someone gets recognition that you desire And rather than rejoicing with them, you're quietly angry that you weren't noticed yourself. Or maybe someone else is given a role or a function or a position in the church that you wish you had or or you desire a gift that they have. Folks, envy is a terrible cancer in the heart of any relationship. Most of the time, it isn't expressed outwardly. It's just retained inwardly. We wouldn't dare say that someone shouldn't have nice things or receive nice things or promotions because that would sound absolutely terrible, wouldn't it? But even if envy is never verbalized, it kills deep relationships. 
and it kills effective unity within a church body, makes our, makes our hearts cold and hard. And while we may smile at each other and exchange pleasantries on the surface, we don't function like the deeply interdependent body that God intends for us to be. Guile, hypocrisies, and envies often work quietly, but they kill the health of a church like few other things can. Be brutal on yourself. Get rid of them all. And then God forbids all evil speaking. The Greek word is katalalia. It's also translated in the Bible or in the New Testament as backbiting. It really means to slander. A slander refers to efforts to tear someone else down through one speech. Oftentimes, slander involves saying things that are untrue or that manipulate the facts in such a way that it portrays the other person in a darker light than they really are with the intent of portraying yourself in a better light than you really are. But it's also possible to slander someone while being quite honest. Maybe you feel like someone is looked upon a bit too highly and you have some legitimate dirt on them. So you find ways to slip it in so that the person is brought down a couple of notches. Now, there are constructive times to discuss the faults of others, such as if you're, if you're talking about how to help them grow and whether or not they're qualified for a particular job. But we need to be honest. We can't be dishonest in it. But most of the time when we talk about the faults of other people, it is not about helping them. It's about pumping up our own ego or getting something off of our chest because we have a beef with someone. It's certainly not about unfeigned love of the brethren, is it? We slander someone anytime we're critical in an, in an unconstructive context that is not motivated by charity. It's not always true, <clears throat> but there is a lot of truth to the children saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. <laughs> not always true. There's times when it, it may not be especially... Um, uh, just warm and fuzzy, and you've got to say something to someone, but slander has no place in the life of a Christian or in the relationships within one of the Lord's churches. God commands us to put it off. And so here's the application. Peter listed these five relational sins that have no place in a church or anywhere else in the life of a Christian. Friend, don't tolerate these sins. Don't make excuses for these sins in the life of yourself, in the life of a family member, in the life of one of your children or another church member. Don't couch pride and selfishness in a cloak of righteousness because frequently that's how these types of things will come out. We have some type of self-righteousness that we're trying to display, or at least that's what we try to indicate by doing these very sins. Be a person of true humility and sacrificial love that puts others ahead of yourself. Also, also protect our church from these sins. If you observe dishonesty or hypocrisy or slander in a brother or a sister, don't listen quietly or be amused by it. Lovingly and appropriately confront it. Deal with it. Keep our body healthy and cancer-free from anything that will hinder or destroy our effectiveness. But before we go on, we need to ask ourselves, why Peter brought up this list in a text about receiving the word? <clears throat> what does envy or slander have to do with my devotions, my personal devotions, or my family devotions, or my ability to listen to a sermon or to sit under some teaching? Well, clearly God believes that they're connected, the fact is that you cannot receive the word with its full benefit if your heart is filled with selfishness and pride. Love is at the center of God's nature. And if we're unwilling to obey God in this crucial area, we don't truly have a heart to receive God's word. Because of that, Peter stated that a necessary condition to truly receive the word with all of its full benefit is that we must purify ourselves. We must purify our relationships. As I mentioned in my introduction, it might be that you're not happy with your hunger for the word and your reception of it. It might be that part of the problem is that you're disobeying God in your relationships in one of these areas. Put off 
hatred and put on love and your intake of the word of God will greatly improve. And so with that condition in view, let's consider the main command of the text here, shall we? The command to receive God's word is that we must desire his word fervently. As I already mentioned, this is the central focus of the text. Desire the sincere milk of the word. Peter was clearly thinking of scripture based on the context of chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. And, and, uh, and I actually want to go back and just read that to you briefly so we can tie those thoughts together. He said in verse 23 of chapter 1, being born again, not of incorruptible, or I'm sorry, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass withereth and the flower, uh, the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you, right? And so he, he defines what that word is. It, is. it is that which through the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ is declared or preached to them and brought to their hearing. And so, um, so that's, that's the clear context. Then as he goes on and says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word so that you can grow by it. But to appreciate the command that's given here, we have to reflect on the illustration that plays a crucial role in developing the whole thought that he was portraying. Peter's basic illustration is that we are to desire the scriptures like a newborn baby desires milk. It's a, a kind of humorous and yet um, powerful image that's being displayed. It's an illustration that all of us can identify with, at least to some extent. If you're a parent... You may get tired just thinking about it as you remember the sound of a screaming baby at midnight and then at 2 a.m. and then at 4 a.m. and then at 6 a.m. and maybe times in between that as well, waking up hungry for fresh milk. <laughs> now, whether you've personally been there or not, all of us can understand the dependence that infants have on their mother's milk. God designed it to be that way. Those infants are completely helpless to get their own food. The only power that a small baby has is his helpless and desperate cry. That's it. Without his mother, an infant would starve. Also, an infant is totally dependent on milk because he's unable to digest anything else. Milk is his lifeblood. And so he desires it desperately. He desires it intensely. And he'll not be quiet or content until he gets enough to be satisfied. Hmm. God designed babies to have this urge and to have this urgency because milk is necessary for their growth. It gives them immunities and enables them to grow and to mature. Now, similarly, Peter stated that the word is essential for the spiritual growth and maturation of God's people. All through the New Testament, the consistent theme is that when a person surrenders wholly to Jesus Christ, he's given spiritual life and a new nature. We read about it in chapter 1 already. As a new creation, that person begins to put off facets of the old evil nature and begins to be sanctified and begins to be holy. A, a steady, substantial growth is intended by God is that person puts aside, lays aside the old character and the old thoughts and the old ways and learns to live inwardly and outwardly in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. Now, we'll never reach perfection in this imperfect world, will we? These imperfect bodies and their old sinful natures uh, are still have their old sinful natures attached. And that'll be true all the way until we pass out of this world. But there should and there must be a continual and substantive development to be more and more like Jesus Christ until the day that we leave this earth and receive our glorified bodies and are like Christ. And so it should be an ever-increasing trend until we arrive at that point. Now, in chapter 1 and verse 5, 
in chapter 1 and verse 9, chapter 1 and verse 10, salvation is spoken of. And it continually referred not just to the immediate rescue from the penalty of sin when a person believes in Jesus Christ, but it refers particularly in that context to the future state when our faith shall be sight and we'll be fully saved out of this corrupt world and we'll stand perfect and entire before God. We'll be saved then not just from the penalty of sin, but from the very presence of sin at that time. A glorious day <laughs> that'll be. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Now, th this is not some type of progressive salvation that he's describing here because um, we have all of God that we're going to get the instant that we repent and humble ourselves before him. But it is referring to the future completion of his, uh, of his salvation um, when Jesus Christ returns, or when he calls us home to be with him, we'll be made completely perfect, and we'll receive our full inheritance. And that hope is closely connected to God's present work of spiritual growth in the lives of his children. This verse says that as we grow through the word, we are moving toward the completion of God's purpose of our salvation. Now, specifically, our present intake of the scriptures produces spiritual maturity that will culminate in glorification someday. I don't know how serious you're willing to think about it, but that is a sobering perspective on scripture intake. If that's God's purpose for it, and that's why we should desire it so intensively, that's sobering. When you read the Bible, when you listen to preaching as a child of God, you are moving toward glory as God transforms you and as you are willing to take it, receive it, and apply it. It is ah, it's incredibly valuable. God's word is. It is sincere and it is pure, as verse 2 states, in contrast to the sins of verse 1. Uh, by the way, that word, um, the sincere milk of the word, the word sincere, it means Pure. That's literally what it means. And so you have the purity that's brought through the word of God and through the pure word of God itself, contrasted with the filth and the corruption of our own natures that needs to be extracted and put off continually. God's word is pure and beautiful. It's powerful. It is abiding. It is transforming. It's good for us to remember very often just how valuable this book is that God has given to us. This book is your life. Nothing else can replace it. It is the very thoughts and statements of God Almighty, spoken by Him and then penned down by those that He used to capture those thoughts on paper for us and preserve them for all time. Jesus Himself said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, because of that, Peter commanded his readers to desire this word like a baby desires milk. In other words, we've got to sense our desperate, our desperate need for the word, and we've got to hunger for it. Do you recognize your need for the word? Some people don't. Do you see that you can't live without it, and that it's more necessary to life than physical sustenance? any given day. Now, of course, it's one thing to listen to a sermon like this and to affirm that, yeah, yeah, the word's important. Amen, I agree with that. <laughs> but living that way is entirely different. Do you live like the word of God is essential to life? Do you crave it? <clears throat> Do you cry out for it like a newborn cries out for milk? Let's reflect on your day so far. What has it reflected about your value of God's word? Did you come to church this evening hungry to hear from God, having intentionally prepared your heart to hear from him? Or are you merely fulfilling the duty of a good Christian? What does the remainder of your life say about your desire for the word? Because attending a 60-minute service 
a couple of times per week doesn't seem to measure up to the urgent desire that God demands of us in this verse. On Sunday, we considered some of the same types of thoughts. Does your church attendance reflect a hunger for the word in keeping with this text? What about your daily habits of Bible study? What about your engagement with your family or with your neighbors or with your co-workers or with the community? Now again, some of you have crazy hectic lives. I get that. But in our day, we have such easy access to scripture. You can freely carry God's word anywhere you go. You can have the Bible on your phone. You can listen to it in the car. There's all kinds of good sermons that are available to listen to at any time at, at, at your fingertips. With such easy access, it's hard to imagine how any of us couldn't fulfill a true hunger for the word if we really have it. If your life is hectic, <laughs> are you making creative efforts to be in the word of God? If you have no desire for the word, it indicates death. If you struggle being in the word, it indicates that some disease may be present. You may need to remove some sin. You may need to order your life properly. As I mentioned in my introduction, some are pretty good about regular time in the word, but it can easily become little more than a task on a to-do list. My challenge to all of us is to remind ourselves often of the intense value of what you hold in your hands right now. Remind yourself that you cannot live without this book. Without, without it, you are a helpless infant on the brink of starvation. And remind yourself often that the Bible is not just a book. And reading it is not just a discipline. The Bible is God's speech to you. It is wisdom. It is life. When you read it, you're hearing from God Almighty as he feeds you essential nutrients. It's been very good for me to reflect on these simple facts while I've been preparing this message. I need to remember those continually. Folks, the Christian life is not a casual walk along the beach. It is a war. Your flesh never sleeps. Satan never sleeps. The world's constantly trying to drag us away from God's values. We've got to see this war for what it really is. We've got to see that we will starve without the word. And we've got to hunger accordingly. May God help us to feel the weight of the war that we're engaged in, to sense our need for his word, and to desire it intensively as a newborn baby desires milk. Well, finally, I want to show you the motivation for desiring God's word and the result of taking it in. And that is all built around the word grace. It's built around God's grace, and that's found in verse 3, which begins with the word if. Look at it. If so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Verse 3 begins with the word if. But Peter's point, I believe, was not to call into question whether or not his readers had experienced God's grace. He wasn't questioning that they were saved. We know that already from the entire context of this letter. He believed that they were saved. Rather, the point of the condition, as it was back in, um, in uh, chapter 1 and verse 17, if ye call on the Father, the point of the condition was to make his readers reflect deeply on what was about to be said. Peter wanted us to ponder how we have already experienced the grace of God so that we desire it even more. Peter draws this statement from Psalm 34 in verse 8. It states this, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. In that psalm, David reflected on how the Lord cared for his people. Though undeserving, he had seen the Lord direct his steps. He had seen the Lord provide for his needs. And so he called on God's people from his own experience to look to the Lord and to experience that goodness for themselves. He'd tasted it. He wanted others to taste it as well. David was confident that those who drink deeply of the Lord's goodness will be fully satisfied. And that concept of goodness is very similar to the concept of grace. It's something that's given to those that don't deserve it. I mentioned drink deeply because he didn't just urge us in Psalm 34 and verse 8 to take a sip 
or to take a little bite, so to speak. It's not just a test. It's not just a trial run. The word tasted implies a full experience here in our text today. If so be that you have tasted or consumed the reality that God is gracious. Obviously, it's an analogy from eating food. And so I want you to just picture yourself for a minute enjoying your very favorite meal. What's your favorite meal? Got it in your mind? I'll give you a second, all right? I know. Well, no, it shouldn't take you very long to figure out. All right, you got your favorite meal in your mind. When I'm eating something that I really, really enjoy, I chew it well, I savor every bite because I want to experience the flavors. I want to get the full experience. I want to enjoy it. It's pleasurable. It's wonderful. Those who drink deeply of God's word are able to have a deep experience of God and his grace. Those who have truly tasted that the Lord is gracious treasure God's word as the most precious thing that they have. Or at least it's brought them the most precious thing that they have, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're blessed with the opportunity to experience his grace and his goodness in many different ways. That begins for us when he saves us and forgives our sins. We experience his grace as he helps us overcome sin and pursue godliness. His word is wisdom that guards our steps. It protects us. It gives peace and it gives joy. The Holy Spirit abides within us and leads us in the light of the word. We experience the joy and camaraderie of a church family because of God's grace and his goodness. I could go on and on. Now, being a Christian is not always easy, but as we walk by the Spirit, We have the constant experience of the Lord's grace and goodness constantly leading us. Peter's purpose in this verse was to call on us to reflect on the goodness of God that we've experienced. I want to challenge you to do just that. Consider all the ways that you daily benefit from the grace of God. As you reflect on these realities, Peter desired that it would increase your hunger for more and more. Build a hunger for God by reflecting on the blessings that you've received from him. Now, by the way, if you think about building a healthy appetite for the right things, your appetite can and does get spoiled by trash. It gets ruined by trash. And you've got to put off some evil appetites of the physical flesh in order to be able to really enjoy and appreciate things that are truly healthy for you. And the same is true on a spiritual level. There is much that needs to get shed out of our lives so that we're not distracted or our appetites are not dulled for the right things. Peter desired that as you build a hunger for God, that you would build a hunger for Scripture. It's because when you read the Bible or when you listen to preaching or teaching that is driven by the text of inspired Scripture, you're hearing directly from the God of all grace. It's so important to embrace Peter's mindset as we think about Bible study. Sometimes people look at Scripture as nothing more than a list of rules or as God's means of curbing their fun or their enjoyment or pleasure in some kind of area. Some can dread Bible study because it's convicting and potentially painful to them. Bible study and biblical preaching should cut at times. But an essential aspect of spiritual maturity is the ability to see the goodness of God, not just in the promises of Scripture or the comfort that it provides, but also in the commands and the rebukes that help us to rightly relate to God and to His truth and that protect us from harm now and for eternity. I'm very thankful for how I have experienced the goodness of God in my life as one of His children. Thankful for how God has given peace and comfort when I've lost people that I love. I'm thankful that God has opened my eyes to his glory so that I'm not blindly living for temporary pleasures while being condemned to hell. I'm thankful for the wisdom and for the correction of scripture that's guided me towards having a healthy family and many wonderful relationships. I'm thankful for the supreme benefit of salvation that I've understood through the scriptures because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
I'm deeply grateful for learning what a scriptural church is, for being brought to unity with others in this church body. I could go on and on. The Lord's been so good to me, and he's been so good to you. And since we meet him in the Bible, may God increase our hunger for his word, and may he help us to remove all the relational sins that would threaten our reception of the word. If you're a child of God, I hope that it's your prayer that you would receive God's word with a pure and a hungry heart above all other priorities. Now, before we close, I want to note that not everybody is able to receive the word and grow through the word in the manner that Peter described here. That's because receiving scripture is not the same as reading some self-help book. The Bible teaches that we are born into this world rejecting God's truth and blind to the core realities about God that are revealed in the scripture. But God's word is powerful. It's sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it cuts right into the needs of our hearts when we hear it. The Holy Spirit works through the word to deal with those issues and then to bring new life. I want you to notice chapter 1. And verse 23, once again, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God causes dead sinners to be born again through his living and abiding word. This new life is the very first step to truly experiencing the grace of God that this text describes and to receiving the word with the sincerity of of chapter 2 and verse 3, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you've never been born again, I want to urge you to receive Christ today. Understand what the scriptures have to say about him. Receive it by faith. Admit that you're a sinner and that you can't save yourself. Put your faith wholly and completely in what Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross. If you do that, you can be forgiven of your sin. You can receive new life. You can experience the fullness of God's grace. I pray that you would receive that gift. Every person here in this room, don't reject the goodness of God. Don't reject the wisdom of his word. He has blessed us immeasurably in giving that to us. And as we come to understand the, the richest of all blessings that God has given to us through Jesus Christ, I want us to turn our hearts and a few final moments of worship this evening to remember. If we didn't have the scriptures, then we wouldn't be able to remember. We wouldn't be able to learn these things. But the Lord told us to remember the most precious thing that's taken place in all the history of this universe. And so we're going to observe the Lord's Supper tonight together. And I want to preface it in a couple of ways. First of all, nobody, uh, for the most part, nobody here is a stranger to what the Bible teaches about communion. If you're a guest here with us tonight or a family member that's not a member of this church, then, um, then you should understand that we practice um, what we call restricted communion, um, that uh, we, we understand from the New Testament that this is a privilege that's associated with church membership. And so, um, but with that being said, we, we welcome you to observe and to see our order, to see how we do things, and marvel at the preciousness of what God has provided as well. And so we're going to have uh, the fellas go ahead, and if you'll begin 